Christmas. Would you mind standing with me in honor of God's Word? If you have a Bible with you, turn to Matthew chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Lord, I just pray that you would break off of our hearts and our minds all of our traditional things that we tend to hold to that, that keep the Christmas story out of the realm of history and keep it in the realm of just beloved tradition. Lord, I pray that you'd break in, that you'd wash our hearts, wash our minds, and then speak to us from this passage, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 You may be seated. <clears throat> So the title of the message this morning is, Who is this King? It is just very easy when you read about stars and wise men to get into this realm of myth and story and, and then we don't, it, it doesn't help that we We've got the, the manger scene. There's one at our house, and it's got the shepherds are there, and the, and the magi are there, and, and you, you have this picture that's very nice, and it's very pleasing. The only problem is, is it didn't happen that way. That's the only problem. The magi are not at the birth. Jesus has already been born in Bethlehem. They are coming from the east, and they come to a house. So Mary and Joseph, Luke's gospel says, went after the birth, they were there for 40 days for purification, and then they went back to Nazareth, which is where their home was. Now they have moved to Bethlehem. We don't know why exactly, we could surmise, but they, they moved to Bethlehem. They are in a house and the Magi come not to see an infant, but the Greek word is child. Jesus is no longer an infant that's used in Luke. He is now a toddler. This is at least a year and a half after the birth. Who is this king? For point one, who are the Magi? We know just from the text that they come from the east. Directly east of Israel is uh, modern day Iraq. Babylon is there. I believe that they are in the order 
of Daniel. Daniel was in Babylon in 600 BC. He gave prophecies and he, not only was he one of the Magi, he was the guy that saved the Magi. The Magi were all going to be killed except that Daniel got the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and then Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2 it says made him the ruler of the Magi. He became the chief Magi. <clears throat> Why do I believe that these guys come from Daniel and they are, are from Babylon and they are the order of Daniel? <clears throat> I believe that they had access to all of Daniel's prophecies. Daniel had said that there was a king coming who would be universal, that he would be worshiped by the whole world. He would be God. Daniel had given the very time that Messiah would be on the earth, this ruler, the ruler that would come from heaven. We talked about that a few weeks ago in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. The reason why I believe that they are operating on Daniel's writings is their certainty. They are not coming to see if there is a king. They're, they're saying, where is he? He is here. The, there is a certainty, not only that this king has been born, but that he is the promised king that is, belongs the worship of the whole world. There is such a certainty in them. I just believe that they came from, from Daniel's order and are operating on his writings. Has anybody ever heard of Nostradamus? Nostradamus, probably 500 years ago, gave some prophecies and, uh, about all the things that are going to happen. And, and whenever, whenever there's a new thing coming up that Nostradamus has said something about, everybody starts their writings on Nostradamus by saying, look at all the times he was right in the past. And, and it's really, really sketchy of how right he was in the past because everything is in so many images and, and it, maybe, maybe not. It, it's just, but, but the credibility of the past is what gives you faith that maybe the future thing is true too. Well, here's what happened with Daniel. In 600 BC, Daniel is given many prophecies that are unbelievably specific. He says after Babylon, there's going to be another kingdom called Persia. He says how they're going to come in. There's, it's going to be a dual kingdom between the Medes and the Persians. And then he says they're going to be superseded by another kingdom whose first king is going to be like a horn and the and he's going to run and break this other kingdom and, and it, he's going to fill the whole earth, but he's going to die right in the middle of his youth. And then his kingdom's going to be spread out to four, four kings. Four horns are going to grow up from this one horn that, that completely destroyed Persia. And he is giving very specific specific words about Greece, about Alexander the Great, who hasn't even come yet, and how he's going to dominate, and then how he dies very young. And his four generals, Greece goes to the four generals, these four horns. Guys, they have been following these prophecies throughout the years. Daniel is batting 100%, very specific prophecies. When Daniel says there's a ruler uh, that's like a son of man, he's going to be born as a son of man, and he's coming from heaven, and all of the earth is going to worship him. These guys, these guys have seen something where they, ha they are coming with such confidence. They've come from a long way. They are coming with gifts. They are not seeing if a king has been born. They are looking for the one who was born king of the Jews. And then thirdly, they were astrologers. The Magi in Babylon were known for stargazing. In Daniel 2, it, it says they were astrologers. That was part of who the Magi were. 
Astronomers, of course, study the stars scientifically. Astrologers study the stars, but they also believe that there are signs in the stars. Now, today we associate any astrology with the occult, where somehow the stars are leading us basically instead of God. But I would call that an abuse. The Bible says that God originally made the stars for signs and seasons. The, the, the constellations are ancient. Job quotes several of the constellations. Josephus says the constellations were first given to Seth. So, what did these guys see? What did they see in the stars? For many years, so this is, we're now up to point two, what was the star? For many years, theologians didn't have any idea because they were looking in the wrong time frame. In 1886, a guy named Emil Scherer got a bunch of historians around him. He wrote about the history of the Jewish people, and they concluded, it's called the Scherer Consensus, that Jesus was born in 4 B.C., I'm sorry, that Herod died in 4 B.C., so Jesus had to have been born before that. <clears throat> and for uh, almost 80 years, this went completely unchallenged. King, King Herod was the only one of the Herods that got the title king. All of his children which we have in the Gospels, like Antipas and Philip. Archelaus is the one that comes. None of them got the title king. So if, if King Herod, the only one that got the designation king, die, or, or, or died in 4 B.C., then Jesus had to be born in 4, 5, or 6 B.C. So that's where theologians were looking. That's where astronomers were looking. And that really, there was nothing conclusive as to what the star would have been. So in the mid-60s, a guy named W.E. Filmer, a historian, said, um, it can't be 4 B.C. Herod could not have died in 4 B.C. And he, and he gives the mathematical reason why he couldn't. Josephus <clears throat> says that King Herod dies between a lunar eclipse and Passover. It is the only time in all of Josephus' writings that he mentions a lunar eclipse. This is a very important lunar eclipse. And King Herod dies in between this lunar eclipse and Passover. Well, astronomy is very, very specific. You can go and you can see each sky. They know exactly whenever every eclipse happened in history. You just go back and you figure it out. And there was a lunar eclipse in 4 BC. It was a partial eclipse. And there was the next Lunar eclipse was not until 1 B.C., January 10th, 1 B.C. And the reason why he said, Filmer says, it, it just, it simply cannot be the 4 B.C. Too many things happen between this lunar eclipse, which, which is at March 13th and Passover. And he mathematically shows, these are all the things Josephus said happened, and he gives the minimal amount of days that each one could be accomplished. There's simply not enough time for all of that to happen. He said it has to be the 1 BC eclipse. Herod didn't die in 4 BC. He died in 1 BC. Therefore, Jesus was not born in 4, 5, or 6. He's, he's born in 2 or 3 BC. So historians started looking in a different place. The first thing that they found was the empire-wide census. Luke had said that there was, in the days that, that Augustus had ordered an empire-wide census. That's why Joseph and Mary came back to Bethlehem. When you were at the 4 BC, you look to what possible census this could be, and you could use a Roman tax census that in 8 BC. But the problem with that is, is that Israel wasn't even part of the, 
uh, the, the, the direct Roman Empire. They were a client kingdom. They did not pay taxes directly to Rome, so they wouldn't have even been part of a tax census, and so that's caused a lot of trouble, and how did, how did this happen? But when you go to 3 BC, there's another empire-wide census. It has nothing to do with taxes. Augustus himself, in his records, tells about what happened in February 2nd, 2 BC. It was the 25th anniversary of his, his title, Augustus. The emperor was, was a title, not a, his name. His name was Octavius. In his 25th year, it was the sil silver jubilee. He was given, in his words, from the entire Roman people, the title, Father of the Nation. How did the entire Roman, the entire Roman people means not just Roman citizens, but also the client kingdoms. The entire people that Rome had dominated gave him this title. Well, there's all kinds of evidence now. There's two archaeological pieces, one in Paphlagonia and one in Armenia that says in 3 BC that everybody in their countries had to give an oath to Caesar. Everybody had to come and sign in and give an oath to Caesar. Josephus says Israel was part of an oath to Caesar 18 months before Herod died. They came to give this oath. Orosius, Roman historian, gives the year 3 BC for this census. And here's, I'm just going to use his words. Augustus ordered that a census be taken of each province everywhere and that all men be enrolled. This is the earliest and most famous public acknowledgement which marks Caesar as the first of all men and the Romans as lords of the world. That first and greatest census was taken since in this one name of Caesar all the peoples of the great nations took oath and at the same time through the participation in the census, were made part of one society. So all the people had to take an oath. And Erosius calls it a census. Usually when you did a tax census, you also gave an oath to Caesar. But this one was just an oath to honor Augustus on the 25th anniversary. So there, there it is. We have an empire-wide census that Israel was included in. So then they looked at the skies of what the Magi might have seen, and they specifically checked 3 BC. Dr. Jack Finnegan in 1980 took the results to the Griffith Observatory, where, where a bunch of astronomers were gathered and he gave them the work of E. W. E. Filmer and Dr. Ernest Martin. And he showed them the, the, the repositioning of Herod's death, the census, and then he said this is what was happening in the stars. And in 1980, all of the astronomers started moving over to what the Christmas star was in light of this new evidence. Today, virtually every planetarium in the world shows what I'm going to show as the Christmas star. So what are the Magi looking for? They're astrologers. They're looking in the sky. First of all, of course, they're looking to Leo. Leo is the, is the lion. The lion was represented Israel, specifically Judah, from ancient days in, in Genesis 49. When Jacob is prophesying over Judah, he says, you are going to be like a lion. The scepter is, is, is not going to depart from you until the one comes to whom it belongs. So Leo the lion was Israel's constellation. The brightest star in Leo is Regulus. It's the second brightest star in the sky. Regulus means king. The king star in Leo. Well, on September 14th, 3 BC, another, another star came called Jupiter. <laughs> Jupiter, of course, a planet, but 
Planet is from the Greek wandering star. For the ancients, there were stars that were fixed and there were wandering stars, which we call planets. Well, Jupiter was always called the king planet because it's the largest. On September 14th, 3 BC, the king star and the king planet came into conjunction. Conjunction is simply from a human perspective, it looks like they are one. They're actually millions of miles apart, but they come together. So you've got king star, king planet. They're seeing this. It's the time Daniel said Messiah would appear. Then February 8th, it happens again. Jupiter goes past Regulus, First, the conjunction, and then it goes past it, and then there's something called retrograde motion, which we'll talk about in a moment. And Jupiter comes back, and there's a second conjunction with Regulus, February 8th. Then, on May 2nd, there is another conjunction. Jupiter goes past Regulus again, comes back, there's another conjunction with Regulus. And then, on June 17th, 2 B.C., there is a conjunction beyond all conjunctions. It's the brightest star known in his, or it looked like the brightest star was actually a conjunction in Regulus of Jupiter and Venus right next to Regulus. So let's look at uh, what, the, what the planetariums show, if we could. Is there any way we could get the lights down a little for this presentation? You guys probably aren't going to be able to read this, so I'll read it to you. This is from Dr. John Mosley, who was a professor at the university, in, at, the, at Madison, in astronomy. Scholar, scholars argue whether the Star of Bethlehem was a legend created after the fact of, or a miracle created by God, especially for the occasion of Christ's birth. But if it was a real astronomical event, what could it have been? To continue, okay, here we go. What can we assume about the star based on the Gospel of Matthew? It must have been a newly appeared object since it drew the wise men from the east. The star appeared twice. First, it led the Magi to Jerusalem for an audience with Herod. Later, it stood over Bethlehem. Matthew does not mention that the star was especially bright, and we can assume that Herod and his advisors didn't see it since he asked the wise men when it appeared. The star is referred to as a single object. What was the exact year Christ was born? We've already talked about all that. Let's go to the next one. Astronomical possibilities. Let's go on. So what does that leave? The Magi were Babylonian astrologers. Astrology places particular importance on the motion and position of the planets. If we look at the night sky during the period of 3-2 BC, we can find a very likely candidate for the star of Bethlehem. Next. A royal conjunction. Each planet orbits the sun at a different speed. The inner planets orbit faster. As a result, as seen from the Earth, the planets frequently overtake and pass one another in what is called a conjunction. When two planets are in conjunction, they look like they're close together, when in reality they are millions of miles apart. Next. Planetary conjunctions are fairly common happening. There were nine major conjunctions in the period of time from 3 to 2 B.C., but on August 12th, the 3 BC, there occurred a conjunction of Venus and Jupiter that would have had particular significance to astrologers who had knowledge of the prophecy of the birth of Jesus. On that morning, a conjunction of Venus and Jupiter took place in the constellation of Leo near the star Regulus. Leo was the tribal sign of Judah. To the Babylonians, Jupiter was the king planet, and their name for Regulus was Sheru, the king. Venus was named for Ishtar, the chief Babylonian goddess and associated with femininity. Astrologically, this was an important conjunction. Perhaps even more interesting to ancient astrologers, on September 14th, Jupiter came into conjunction with Regulus, moved past it, then appeared to stop and move backwards until it passed Regulus a second time on February 17th of 2 BC and then a third time on May 8th. Such gyrations are called retrograde motion. It occurs because the Earth is moving faster than Jupiter on an inside track. The same effect can be seen when you pass a slow-moving car on the freeway. The car appears to move backwards against the background, even though you're both moving forward. Next. 
Finally, on June 17th of 2 BC, Jupiter and Venus came into conjunction near Regulus, so close as to appear as one shining light until they set in the west toward Jerusalem as seen from Babylon. This is the brightest conjunction in the last 2,000 years and the 2,000 years before that. This is what they saw. Boom. Okay, we can bring the lights back up. I believe they started their journey. I believe they were absolutely convinced by the June 17th, 2 BC. It's the third straight conjunction They've had three conjunctions of Regulus and Jupiter, and now they have this Jupiter-Venus-Regulus together exploding star. I believe when they make this journey, they are absolutely convinced. But the Christmas star can't be Regulus because it moves. It goes before them. And then it stops over Bethlehem And they see, they see Jupiter in the sky stopping. And um, so when does this happen? They are moving towards Jerusalem. Well, astronomers tell us that it was actually the, the actual date this happened was December 25th, 2 BC. Jerusalem viewing the stars, viewing the stars over Bethlehem, would have seen Jupiter go into retrograde motion or seem to stop in the middle of the constellation Virgo, the Virgin. Viewed from Jerusalem, the Magi would have witnessed Jupiter shining directly down on Bethlehem as it stood stationary among the stars, just like the Bible says. So, finally, who is this king? First, he is God. Notice that they did not come to honor him or give him respect. They came to worship. Here's what Daniel had said, Daniel 7, 13 and 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and he was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So for them, the Jewish king that was coming didn't just belong to Judea. It belonged to the whole world. Everybody was going to come. Everybody was going to worship him. He was going to be given sovereignty over the whole earth, and all were going to come and worship him. And, and these guys are the first fruits. They believed he was God. <laughs> Who else could order the stars? Who else? The stars can't be manipulated. Who else could order these events? It meant that before creation, God had to have known when Christ would come to order the stars to point to his birth in the way that they did. He is God, was their conclusion. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, which they, the scribes and priests quote part of Micah 5, 2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. There is one that is going to be born in Bethlehem whose birth is going to be very different than every other birth. Because every other birth, it's when a human life starts is at birth. But there's going to be one born who's ancient, who's from the days of eternity. He is going to come into time, and he's going to be born, and he's the one that's going to rule. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God in the flesh. The gospel asks a lot of us to believe that the creator came and took on human form, was born in a manger as a baby. It happened. He is God. Who is this king? Secondly, he is a shepherd. The answer the scribes give is very interesting because it's a compression of Micah 5, 2 and Micah 5, 4, and 5 because they don't, they don't even give that his days are from eternity. They wouldn't have to. The, the wise men already believe he's God. They say instead, he is going to be born in Bethlehem of Judah and he is going to be a shepherd. Micah 5, 4, and 5, let me just read that to you. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord as God. And they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And he will be our peace. They don't just give where he's... The only question on the table is where is he going to be born? And they come back with two things. They come back with where he's going to be. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. And then they give how he's going to rule. He's going to rule as a shepherd. Not a tyrant. King Herod was one of the most used of darkness men in the history of the planet. He was a tyrant through and through. He was a Rome appointment. They let him keep his designation of king as it's a client kingdom. And he ruled with this fear in his heart that caused him to kill everybody around him that was a threat to him. His favorite wife, he had eight wives. His favorite wife was a woman named Miriam. She was actually from the Maccabean descent. And the reason why he married her, not only was she beautiful, but it would give some legitimacy to the Jews of, of who he was because she's from the right line. But he suspected her of betrayal. People would bring rumors to him. So he had her killed. And then she had these two sons, Aristobulus and Alexander, who were the rightful heirs that all Israel was waiting, that Augustus was actually, they had gone to Rome to be prepared to be the heirs, and he suspected them too, and he killed them. He was a tyrant. But this, this king that is not going, going to be king, but is born king, he's going to rule in a very different way. He's going to rule as a shepherd. He is actually going to be the peace of his people. Jesus, the shepherd king. Folks, if there's ever been a day that we need peace, it's this day. We've got ISIS. We've got terrorism. In the past, you always knew how to fight a war. There's, there's bad guys, and here's how you fight them. But today, there is so much anger. There is, there is so much of it is caught up in, um, you can't argue with people that are doing it because God told them to do it. Because this is what Allah requires of them. There is so much anger in this world right now. And the governments of this earth, the United Nations, they don't know what to do. There's a leadership crisis in America. In November, they did a poll of uh, approval of Congress. The current rate, lowest in history 
of how is Congress doing their job? Do we trust Congress? 11% of Americans uh, approve of Congress. It's a leadership crisis. There's an economic crisis in this country right now. We are $18 trillion in debt, even though nobody wants to talk about it. We've got a horrible disparity between the wealthy and everybody else that's getting worse and worse and worse. It seems like no one knows how to solve it. And then on top of this, for a Christian, there's a crisis in the church. There's a crisis in leadership, of, of leadership in the church. We have some that are using greed to manipulate and get people to build their little empire. We've got all these stories of molestation at the hands of church leaders. And then we've got the actual numbers. The church is declining. The, the growing, the most growing group religiously in the United States today, and this has been in all of the polls, the, the largest growing group religiously is the non-religious. Those who associate with no one. Everybody else is declining. And if the numbers aren't discouraging enough, then look at the quality. America is in a moral decline, but the most disturbing thing about the church is the, the polls show there's almost no difference between how the church lives and how the world lives. All of these things say crisis. So how do we get peace from Jesus? How can Jesus be our peace as shepherd? First, we receive peace from his purpose as our shepherd. Th this is really kind of cool. I'm going to give you four things, and they all start with P. <laughs> Just like peace. Peace starts with P. So these are all going to start with P. First, we receive peace from his purpose as our shepherd. Here's what Jesus said, John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Herod took everybody else's life. Jesus said, that's the sign of the hired man. The hired man doesn't care about the sheep. He just cares about himself. He just cares about his own position. He's in as long as it works for him. But he flees if it's actually going to cause him trouble. But I am the good shepherd who lays his life down for the sheep. Listen to Romans 4. 25 and 5, 1. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is God's purpose to bring me peace. He died on a cross to bring me peace. Peace with God. Why did I need peace with God? Because we're all sinners. We all deserve wrath. We all deserve before a holy God. We are unholy people. The only way that we could have peace with God is that there would be a sacrifice who would take God's judgment on sin, who would pay the penalty of sin for man, which was the wages of sin is death. Somebody had to pay those wages for God's justice to be upheld. And Jesus came down, God in the flesh, and he paid the wages of sin for us so that this is God's purpose, that you and I could have peace with God through Christ. That we would be covered and washed and cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. And that we would have peace with God. It's his purpose. It's why he came was to give you peace with God. If you do not have peace with God today, you're going to have a chance because it is absolutely God's purpose for you to have peace with him through Christ. Secondly, we receive peace from his power to keep us as our shepherd. Listen to 1 Peter 2.25. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You were going astray, you were wandering, but Jesus now has become the shepherd and the overseer of your soul. 
David said it this way. David, who was a shepherd, gives this, the 23rd Psalm, and he's comparing himself to a sheep and God as his shepherd, and he says this. I will fear no evil, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What's that mean? It simply means this. We are living our life right now in the presence of enemies. There are demonic enemies all around. We've got an enemy right inside of us called the sin nature. It is, it is at enemy, enmity with God. We are living this life in, in this test called human life. We are, we are living it in the presence of enemies. And it can be very anxious spiritually. I'm saved today. I've given my life to Jesus. I see clearly, but I know my heart is prone to wander. Well, David says, I don't need to fear because the Lord is my shepherd. He's got a rod that when enemies get too close, he beats back the enemies that are attacking us. And he's got this staff that's got a crook on it and that whenever I'm eating poison or I'm over here or I've gone too far over there or I'm in self-pity or I'm in a fence, that he gets that crook of that staff around me and he pulls me back. I will not fear evil. I will not live in fear of evil, my own evil or the evil around me. I am not going to live in fear because I've got a shepherd and he's got a rod and a staff. And he knows that I stray, but he also knows how to get me back where I need to be. Amen. Jesus says in Luke 15 that the shepherd, when one has wandered away, he's got a hundred sheep. When one wanders away, he does not say to himself, praise God, I've still got 99. Thank God it was only one. I've still got 99. It's not what it says, does it? It says when one goes astray, the shepherd himself goes after the one. How, for how long? Until he finds it. Amen. There is no price that he will not pay to get you back, to get me back. I think he's spoken that fairly clearly by his death on the cross. There's nothing he won't do. He will go where he has to go to get you back, to get me back. I will fear no evil because you have a rod and a staff. You know about my straying heart and you know how to get me back. You are the shepherd of my soul. Thirdly, we receive peace from the position he gives us as our shepherd. David says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Philip Keller wrote a book on Psalm 23. He, he's actually, his life's employment was being a shepherd of sheep. And he just said, a lot of people don't, don't realize all the stuff David is saying in Psalm 23 because how would they? They're not shepherds. And he says this, Sheep will only lie down in the presence of the shepherd. And he says in his book, he says, you, we're, most of us are familiar with the term, the pecking order. Pecking order is about chickens. You put a bunch of chickens together and they will establish among themselves a pecking order. They peck on each other and then pretty soon you've got the top chicken, second, third, fourth, fifth. Everybody knows their order. You put cattle together, there's a horning order. They will, they will find out who's top dog, who's second, who's third, who's fourth. Well, among sheep, it's called the budding order. They butt against each other, find out who the strongest is, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. Now, when the shepherd's not around, a sheep will never lay down. Here's why. You lose your place in the order. You live in constant fear that if I don't stay standing, I will lose my spot. So my whole existence is to protect myself and to protect my spot in the budding order. Folks, if this is not a picture of 21st century America, then I don't know what is. 
butting against each other to get your spot. If this isn't a picture how the social network works in high school, then I don't know what would be. Everybody's afraid to be themselves. Everybody's afraid to even leave the group because we know that the group's going to gossip about us when we leave and we're going to lose our spot. They're going to become better and we're going to become worse. But in Christ, there's no budding order. When the shepherd's present, every sheep is exactly what the shepherd says he is. Nothing more, nothing less. Did you know that in Christ... We get to come as you are, just like the sign says. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to perform. You don't have to try to get your best foot forward. He knows what both feet look like. (laughs) And he loves you. And we can rest. We can be ourselves filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus places us right where we need to be. I, I got this verse this morning, so they're not going to have it up there. But this is, this is Hebrews 13, 20. Listen to this verse. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good, everything good, for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. One of Jesus' first miracles there, he told Peter to put the net out, and they caught a, a, a fish, so many that the boats were sinking. And in the light of this miracle, Jesus, uh, Peter turns to Jesus and says that he bows down and he says, depart from me. I'm a wicked man. Depart from me, I'm a wicked man. And Jesus says to Peter, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. Fear not your own wickedness. Fear not what you've become yourself. I'm not looking at what you could make yourself. You were created to be in union with me. I'm going to equip you. I'm going to fill you. I'm going to show you how to live as favored sons and daughters. Do not fear. He has raised up the great shepherd of the sheep. He has established an eternal covenant. And that shepherd will equip you and fill you and give you everything you need. Our position is secure in him. And then finally, we receive peace from his presence. He anoints my head with oil, is what David says in Psalm 23. And Philip Keller says, Sheep won't eat when there's pests in their ears. If they are bothered, they will stop eating. When sheep stop eating, they get really scrawny. And when when people see scrawny sheep, they don't think, why don't those sheep take care of themselves? When they see scrawny sheep, they say, where's the shepherd? What's the shepherd doing? He's supposed to be taking care of the sheep. Everybody knows sheep don't take care of themselves. The anointing of oil, they would have a vat filled with oil, Philip Keller tells us, and take the sheep's whole head and dunk it in oil. It was like, um, kind of like off. It kept pests away. It kept pests from their ears. He anoints my head with oil. Here's what Jesus said. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. My purpose 
is to give you peace, my very peace, the very presence of the Holy Spirit. Not as the world gives do I give. World won't give you peace until ISIS is defeated. And I got news for you, when ISIS is defeated, it'll be like Al-Qaeda being defeated. Now there's something else. For the world to give you peace, we have to now believe that we got the, that the, the, the right leader in the White House. Now everything will be fine. Folks, there's not a Democratic or a Republican answer for America. I guarantee that. The, world, the world's not going to give you peace till that deficit starts coming down. Jesus said, I'm going to give you peace in the midst of a very troubled, fearful world. I'm going to give you peace that comes directly from my presence. Here's what it says in Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything make your requests known to God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God that passes all understanding. No one will even understand why you're at peace. Will guard over your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. The anointing oil. Not only that establishes peace, but then protects our peace. So what's the problem? Here's the problem. The Bible says that the devil goes about as a roaring lion. The devil doesn't have a pitchfork and a tail, and he's not red. The Bible says he appears as an angel of light. And he roars. That's the loudest voice in your head. What are the voices? One is fear. Why does he roar fear? about the future, fear of failure, fear that you're not good enough, fear, 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 fear. Why? He wants to wrap your identity up in fear. He's lost his authority on the cross to gain any right into your life. He's got to get you to believe a lie about your own identity. So he tries to wrap people in fear. Maybe the loudest voice in your head isn't fear. Maybe it's pain. Something you've been abused, you've been molested. And pain, pain, pain. And every time you try to rise up, every time you try to do anything, that loud voice of pain, that roar comes back. What's he trying to do? He wants to wrap your identity in your pain. Did you know that you don't have to have an identity in pain? Jabez, the Bible says that he was born and his mother went through a lot of pain birthing him, so she named him Jabez, which means pain. (laughs) <laughs> please, please, parents, please. <laughs> Don't name your children pain. But Jabez, at some point in his life, decides, I don't want to be pain. He says this. He prays a prayer. Bless me indeed, O oh God. Enlarge the stakes of my tent and let it be seen to everybody that sees my life that your hand has done it. Let me be known not as clever or strong or resourceful. Let me be known as godly, that God is with him. Keep me from pain, he prays. And then it simply says this in Chronicles, God heard his prayer. Did you know that God will hear your prayer when you tell him, I don't want my identity to be in pain? I realize that an enemy, the thief came to kill, steal, and destroy. It's all about identity, folks. It's all about who you think you are. And if he can wrap you up in your pain, you're, you're going to have a ceiling in your life that you're just not going to be able to get by, beyond. You've got to decide, I'm not going to be called pain anymore. Well, what about offense? Maybe the loudest voice in your head is offense. Injustice! And you're angry. You're angry at the leaders. You're angry at the church. You're angry at... ISIS, you're angry, you're angry because of injustice in the world. Sex slaves, you're angry because of all that's going on in the world. You're angry because of things that have happened to you that were unjust. It's not right, it's not right, it's not right. And you become angry, and the loudest voice in your head 
is this offense. Offense with people, and it's always back to an offense with God, and here's why. God asks us to lay our injustices down at the cross. He, God asks us to not be judge, but to let him be judge. To lay down and to forgive others as he has forgiven me. Has anybody noticed we live in a very angry world right now? People don't know how to get free from anger. Anger is a motivation. It is fuel. It, you, anger gets stuff done. But that angry voice will never bring the kingdom of God. The anger of man, it says, will not work the righteousness of God. We must lay it down. We must not make our identity in our offense. The roaring lion. Jesus comes to take our identity and put it in him. He says this, I am not going to leave you as orphans, but I am going to give you the Holy Spirit. And he says to his disciples, the one who is with you now, and they had seen him because they had seen the Spirit on Jesus and they had seen the Spirit do miracles through them. He says, the one who is with you now will be in you. The new engine of human beings is God in us. The Christ who has been born in Bethlehem wants to be born in me and you. This is the plan that we were created to live in union with God. And I just want to encourage all of us, we can have the worship team come. I want to encourage all of us. <laughs> this isn't just about you. Yeah, it is about you. You need to have peace with God. You need to lay down all of these other identities for you. Absolutely, it is for you. But listen to me. This world doesn't know where to go right now. This world has nowhere to go. The world needs us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The world needs us to actually believe the Christmas story and not just go through the motions of it. We need to actually have the Good Shepherd dunk our heads in oil and lay down every lesser identity. This has got to become real because America's in trouble right now. And the only answer is revival. A revival? Revival is always about the church. The answer for America is way beyond revival. It's called awakening. Awakening is when Jesus isn't just the talk of the church, although that's a good start, that when our small groups, we're actually talking about Jesus and not just about a new recipe for pumpkin pie. That's a good start. When the church is actually talking about Jesus and our life in Jesus, that's a good start. That's revival. Awakening is when they're talking about Jesus in the bars. When they, after a few beers, they're saying, I don't, I don't know what to think about this, but I'm going to submit it to you. My nephew just got healed. He came out of a wheelchair. What is going on? Who is this God? Here's the good news. It's God's plan. Awakening and real. All right. Everybody can bow their heads, please, for just a moment. I've, I want to pray for two groups of people. First group is this. You do not have peace with God right now. Maybe you think you're cursed by God or that God doesn't like you or God doesn't love you. Maybe you think the reason why is because it's the horrible things that you have done. Maybe you used to be a believer and you have strayed away and you've gone away so far and in your mind, God could not even like you anymore. I got news for you. The prodigal son is about somebody that used to be in the house and went astray. And do you want to know what the father was thinking about when the son came back? Party. Joy. He couldn't wait for him to get back. He ran to him. It is God's purpose to give you peace with him. It is why Jesus left heaven. He laid his life down for you. 
we're all looking for love and many will promise love but God demonstrates his love for this for in this way while we were still sinners Christ died for us if that is you today the Bible says Jesus is standing at the door knocking he will not push the door he will not force the door he just knocks you and I have to open that door ourselves we have to say yes Jesus Because this is between you and God, I've got everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed. But because I know it's hard for people that aren't used to spiritual things to voice them, to act on them, I want to help people because somebody helped me. So, so if that is you, Jesus is knocking and you want peace with God that he promises. Would you just raise your hand right now? High enough and long, I see double hands back there. Hand and hand, God bless you, and hand here, God bless you. You can put those down in the back in the balcony, God bless you. And that whole group can put their hands down. Is there anybody else by upraised hand? Jesus is knocking, and you want to open the door. Anybody else by upraised hand? Could we have everybody that raised their hand, put your hand over your heart right now and pray something like this. Jesus, thank you for loving me, even me. Lord, I know peace will never come by me working out all my problems. Peace has to come in you. Lord, I repent of my sins and I ask you to wash me and cleanse me and even today I receive that gift of eternal life that you died to give me. I receive now in Jesus' name. Amen. Then could we stand together? The second call is this. You want Jesus to dunk your head in oil this morning. You are already a favored son and daughter of God. You've given your life to Christ. You've already said yes to him. But you want him to dunk your head in oil. You want to lay down the other voices of fear and of pain, of an offense. And you want to welcome the Holy Spirit that Jesus gave to be not just with us, but in us. I, if, if you go here, you already know this. I call this the receive position where we open our arms like this and close our eyes. And, and if that's you, this is all I want you to do is just close your eyes and open your arms just like this. And we're just going to pray. Lord, these are your sheep. They're not mine. I'm one of the sheep. I'm part of the group here. These are your sheep, Jesus. You're the good shepherd. You see what's going on in, not only in the whole world, but in our world. You know the voices that have attacked us and, and yelled at us and screamed at us. You know what we think about right before we go to bed and early in the morning when we get up. You know what torments us. Jesus. We are with thanksgiving coming before the throne of God right now. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your great love. Thank you that you're a good shepherd. You're a good God. Now, Lord, right now we give you our fear. We give you our pain. We give you our offense. And we lay them down at the cross and we say, Jesus, you are worthy. You are the lamb who was slain. You are worthy to be the judge of everybody. And I'm not. As, as an act of worship, we lay down all of these false identities that try to wrap themselves around us. And Jesus, just because you can, I'm asking you to do this. Would you anoint every head right now? every head with oil, Jesus. 
Because God, we need more than a message. We need more than a speech. We need more than traditions. We need more than, quote, the Christmas spirit. We need the reality of God in our lives. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come and fill us. Come and lead us. You will be led forth by peace. And you will walk in my joy. Jesus. Jesus, the world needs our peace and our joy. They need your peace and your joy, but it comes through us. Would you please make us lights around the Christmas table as the relatives gather? Would you make us something of heaven? We are praying the prayer of Jabez. Bless us indeed, O oh God. Enlarge the stakes of our tent and do it in a way that we don't get the credit where everybody says, that's God. That was God. Let us be known, Lord, as godly people in the best sense of the word. Fill us this Christmas with you, we pray. God, we love you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Woo! Jesus! We're going to have uh, some prayer teams up here, and you're welcome to hang around and worship a little or uh, have a great week. Bless you.